And now I have the just great joy and privilege of introducing to everyone one of our dearest friends in our work, Tom DeLong. And I'm just going to embarrass you, Tom, for one moment by saying something about your background. So Tom is the former Philip J. Stromberg Professor of Management Practice in the Organizational Behavior Area at Harvard Business School, where he still serves as a senior fellow. He's the author of, I think, one of the most important books on leadership called Flying Without a Net. Turn Fear of Change into Fuel for Success, which is recognized by the editors of Amazon as one of the top 10 books written on leadership this century. But for our purposes, perhaps more importantly, was one of the pioneering introductions of the notion that authenticity and vulnerability were essential qualities in leading in modern times. He also co-authored two books focused on leading professional services firms, having been a consultant to consultants for several decades. One is called When Professionals Have to Lead, a New Model for High Performance, and the other is about professional services, cases, and text. More personally, I'd like to say that when I founded Mobius, and it was just a dream of mine that someday we'd all be sitting in a room like this, taking this conversation very seriously, Tom very generously met with me and listened to my vision and encouraged me with very good guidance and even more so just great love and belief in the dream and its importance. And he came to the very first program we ever did for clients and offered us the gift of his keynote then. And he also was the uh, vehicle through which Mobius uh, got to meet Egon Zender and start our partnership that we announced several weeks ago. And just more personally, Tom, I felt your embrace and care for our dream of her helping the world for years, and like you so had my back every time I asked you for help or guidance or mentorship. And I'm very, very grateful that you're here with us tonight and honored to share your beautiful work with everyone. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Let me take you back, if I can, a um, number of years. I'm going to talk to you about two mentors. So the years 1941-1942 in Paris, Germany's running the city. It's divided up. The worst part of the uh, city, of course, goes to the Jews. The best part goes to the Christians. There's a little boy named Danny. Danny's a Jew. His best friend is Christian. They're playing, and they forget that there's a curfew. And Danny realizes he needs to get home. So he takes off this, you know, the little uh, ugly brown sweater, and he has about a mile and a half to go. And he takes off. And he gets about, um, I'm just saying a half a mile away, and he turns the corner, and there stands the German soldier. And the soldier says, come here. This German soldier looks at him and picks him up and starts to hold him and embrace him like a father, <clears throat> like a father would hold a nine-year-old son. And little Danny reports later, he says, I could feel the tears landing on my head. And the soldier set me down and says, you run home. And then he said, you remind me of my nine-year-old son. So now little Danny Kahneman gets home. <laughs> and here's mom. And mom's a mess. Dad's gone. And, da uh, <laughs> and Danny Kahneman, he still lives by Danny. Danny Kahneman reports, I learned two principles from my mom that night. The first principle I learned is humans are the problem. You can't trust them. They're irresponsible, ba 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 ba. And the second principle I learned from my mom was humans are the only answer. Humans are the only answer. And so little Danny Kahneman spends a lifetime trying to resolve, resolve these two constructs and taking the world of 
social psychology and economics and trying to bring them together, and if we wanted to talk about heuristics or blind spots or a number of different things, Kahneman's going to be central to this. But he still says, and he's in his 80s now, a day doesn't go by that I don't see my mother telling me those stories. Now, um, today's about you and about us um, talking about the purpose, perhaps your purpose. I'm in the process now of trying to transform the curriculum at the Harvard Business School to introduce authenticity. And uh, I have my hands full, uh, and we're doing some things we think that, that are going to help. So that's the first story. The second one has to do with my mentor that I felt raised me, and I did my doctoral work with him. And it's a guy named Edgar Schein. Do you know, the, you know Edgar Schein? You know Edgar Schein. You know Edgar Schein. You need to know Edgar So Edgar Schein, I said, how did you ever come up with this process consultation stuff? And he says, well, as a kid, I was running from World War II, our family, five different countries for five years. And he says, I learned that the way to get, al get along with people is to listen and ask questions. And, he's, and then he says, Tom, I, I, then I, they moved to Chicago, same thing. He says, I learned if I wanted to get along with folks, I needed to listen and I needed to observe. And so then here's Edgar Schein, who creates process consultation, uh, talks about medic, uh, metacognitions, talks really about culture. And he says, I think about those times uh, of how I emerged in this particular arena. So I'm hopeful that during this week that you're thinking about those experiences that have informed why we're here together and why we do what we do. What I thought, I, I, the first principle, and where's Amy? Uh, Amy said, what are three or four principles that you try to ground your students with. The overall premise of the course and the work I do is I want individuals to have a greater sense of what happens inside another person when they're with them. What happens inside another person when they're with you? That's the specific. What happens? What happens? Do you want to lean in? Do you want to be different? Do you want to raise your game? What is that? And then I reverse engineer the first principle that our course is based on, and that at least in my uh, private work, is number one, how can I increase the line of sight? Increase the line of sight in a lot of different ways. And I want to give you an example. I have a, <laughs> I have a letter. Uh, it's a, a reflection from students. And every week, we push the students to do something that makes them just a little nervous. Okay? And this is one of the assignments about increasing line of sight so that they can experience themselves in different ways. We tell them, an anthropologist has just watched you for a year. And they've taken a video of you. And they're going to tell you what your values are. What are your, these are your values. Okay. And then you're going to write down the ones you're selling to the world. So this is, this is, this is Chris Ardris. This is a spouse theory and theory in use. But not at a macro level, at a micro level. And the students have 48 hours to do something in their lives to reduce the variance. Okay, 48 hours. They got to do something. I love this. I love this kid. Uh, Professor, I need to apologize for something I did. This is what happened. I lied to my fiance. It was a white lie to be clear, but a lie nonetheless. Okay. So um, I don't know the other shades of lies, 
but he's trying to set a context. He's trying to soften it a bit. Okay. Um, the uh, a white lie is defined as a strategic untruth. Just, just a, I just thought I'd share that with you if you had any kind of. Okay. This guy's precious. I wanted to have, quote, guys time last night, and I wanted to reprieve from the phone calls and text messages. So I lied to her and told her I was going to see a movie, and I chose a long movie. I figured that she'd be less inclined to call or text if I were at the movie. This sounds trivial, but it bothered me. Okay, now this line's important. I really value trust and honesty. And I value my relationship with my fiance more than anything in this world. So I finally decided to do your assignment and tell her. And she was rightfully upset with me. Okay. Now he goes on, as if he needs to, but he does. <laughs> he says, Professor DeLong, I have a tendency to do this as if he needed to tell me that this was his first white lie. I don't lie about big things, and I often fess up after the fact. But I far too often commit white lies in this, to smooth out situations. It's easy for me to do. I've had a lot of practice, and it allows me to avoid conflict. It's a lot easier to smooth out a situation with a white lie than it is to be direct, upfront, and honest. Last night, I could have simply picked up her call when I was out with friends and told her that I'd call her later. But I figured that that would upset her. So he, by the way, he's developed this sixth sense to, to know how to get in people's heads and then make decisions for them. It's quite a gift. And he says, I need to get this garbage out of my system. So here's the question for you. I'm going to call him Sean. Let's say that I've invited Sean here tonight. What's a question you'd love to ask him? All you reflective folks. What's a question you'd love to ask? There's so many that will come to mind. Write it down somewhere if you wish. I'm dying to know what you think. By the way, this gentleman. He's going to graduate in the top 4.5% of 900 students. Okay. Basically, perfect scores. And he will be so sought after that the Steve Schwartzmans of the world will take him out to dinner. I mean, anywhere he wants to go. Perfect resume. I, won't, I don't want to bring up the fact that he worked at McKinsey, because I'm sure Mc, McKinsey's underrepresented here tonight. <laughs> OK, and then that was before he uh, went to business school. So I'm dying and with your neighbor, tell me what, tell me, share with your neighbor what you got going on. What's the question? I'm dying to know. Okay, I'm dying to know. Who has a fabulous question? Does somebody have a great question to share with us? I'm going to get a couple of these. Who's got a great question? You have a great question. Not great, but I would be curious about what is conflict for him. You want him to, you want to know how he defines conflict? Yeah, because he's doing all of this to avoid conflict. Yeah, he's doing all this stuff to avoid conflict. I think that's a great question. There was another hand right here close. Yes, sir. What's holding him back from saying the truth? You know, do you th I'm, I, I'd be intrigued. Do you think he knows? <laughs> be fascinated, wouldn't it? Yeah, it'd be fascinated. Yes, there's a hand here. Please, please go ahead. I would ask, um, how would you feel if you know you 
you were the one schmoozed. <laughs> if she was the one doing this to you. Hey, this stuff, this the white lies, it's a guy's thing, right? No. <laughs> It is. It's a guy's thing, right? She, she'd never do this. Yeah. What? That's not my answer. That's not my answer. It's part of the nonsense. Anyway, yeah, so that's a great question. Thank you. What are some, anybody else before I give you the answer? I won't give you the answer. Uh, I was asking what is his last lie. What was his last lie? Why? Why? Uh, apparently, we're, I'm going to facilitate a case discussion here. <laughs> Uh, why? Why do you want to know? Is that right? Yeah, why do you want to know that? Why do you want to know that? Say it louder. When he responds, it will be either a lie or a truth. How are you going to know that? How does he know? Are you going to continue to ask him questions? <laughs> what is this? I've lost. It's 520 and I've lost complete control of the class. Oh my. Oh my. Yeah, please. Assuming he stops lying, has it improved the quality of the relationship when you can be honest? Assuming that he's, yeah, assuming. <laughs> assuming. And by the way, I think a lot of folks have real firm theories about whether people can change and about how are people really motivated. And I see it all the time, and you see it in organizations that a lot of it is kind of happy talk because it really gets back to issues of control, okay? Really, I mean, William James spent how long trying to tell us that the real challenge in life is dealing with freedom and control? How is that gonna be in our life? Joseph Schumpeter, the economist says, really what life is about is on this continuum, you have over here boredom and you have over here pain. It's kind of a cheery kind of way to close out the night. And he says, how are you going to deal with that? Because pain's about growth. And you're working awfully hard to be bored, more and more bored. Yeah. And I'll show you some, little, uh, some data about that. About the older we get, the more frightened we become about taking stuff on. Because it really is frightening. So one last question. You good? Because I want to I go into this a little bit into the line of sight. Sean, what does it cost you to fly this way? What does it cost him? What does it cost him? Yeah. And I'm asking myself the question, how do I move this guy, and can I move him, even a little ways, from image to essence? Because that's my goal, from image to essence. And that's the challenge of 1,800 students at the business school, and it's the challenge of a whole lot of your clients. Yeah. I, we, we would say, Sean, why do you think you feel so guilty? Why do you feel, why do you think you feel so guilty? Yeah. Yeah, you might want to ask that. That's a follow up and start to go deeper and deeper. So in terms of line of sight, what we try to teach the students, what we try to teach the students is as follows, is you need to learn more about what's going on inside of you before you do harm to yourself and to others. And so what I try to introduce are some characteristics that I've studied now for 25 years or so of high need for achievement personalities. And part of it is McClellan, and there's other uh, theorists involved. But here are some of these. And our students hear, this, hear these lists, and they go, how did you know? Okay. Real smart. You learned early on how to leverage that. Tomorrow, Bob, I'm sure Bob is going to talk about this achievement notion about there's a certain subset of the population you know that gets up in the morning and their goal, he calls it the interpersonal stage, they get up in the morning and they say to themselves, this will be a good day if I convince a lot of people that I have my act together. Okay. Okay. It's a, it's a, it's a challenging game to play for a number of different reasons. But, um, so there's achievement drive, uh, impatience, surprise, surprise. And see, what I'm learning over and over again is that to lead is to teach. To lead is to teach. Now the question is, is 
what, what's your belief system around how that takes place? Whether you're Ed Schein or Chris Ardress or David Cantor, whomever. It's this notion of, do I have the capacity to be all in with another human being to have this connection? Okay. Now, the reason this, these are important is that since 1990, nothing has been taken off the plate of managers. It's only been additive. So in 1990, you needed to do performance evaluation, maybe. And then in 1992, it's more. So we're 28 years into this with these kinds of characteristics. They would prefer positive feedback. I would like to be able to define for myself what my role is. And please don't look over my shoulder. You better make sure and, and that everybody gets the email when we talk about office space, or there will be a problem. And finally, and when I'm sharing these with the high need for achievement person, you can hear a pin drop. Because then what I say is the emotion that it evokes when you have too much to do is what we call ongoing guilt. Because no matter how hard you work, you'll never accomplish it all, ever, ever. So this is what you get. Ongoing guilt, a feeling of never enough time, a feeling of abandoning one role for another. I, I hearken back. <laughs> I hearken back about my role as a father or as a partner. Okay. I want to know why I waited for my daughter. We're talking about line of sight. I want to know why I waited till my oldest daughter was 15 before I ever asked her. What's one thing I can do to be, will you fix that for me? Thank you. What's the one thing, what, how can I be a better father? And my heart's beating and fast, and she says, oh, that's easy, Dad. When my friends come over, could you just meet them and then leave? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? You don't want me to teach a case? She goes, you kind of loiter. And she says, I know the rules about boys, drugs, all that stuff, and I know you're going to come back and visit. But it's this note. And so then I get the courage to ask my four-year-old. So Joanna, what's one thing I could do to be better? Oh, Dad, that's easy. At night, when you're reading me stories, sometimes you try to skip pages. <laughs> no, I wouldn't skip pages. Look over there, Joanna. <laughs> oh, look at Live happily ever after. <laughs> Can you believe it? There's no monster. You've been to the loo, da, 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 da. And the question is, is why am I skipping pages? Because I'm not thinking, well, I'm going to spend this time with Joanna, and it's going to help her make decisions later on. It's going to be I'm thinking, if I get her to bed, then I can get back to my real work. Then I can get back to my real work. And that's this addiction that our students feel of I'll feel better about myself if I cross more things off before I go to bed, before I go to bed. So the first principle is, how do I increase the line of sight and give them courage to, to look at it, to look at it? The second concept that I want to share with you is what I call, I say this to the students, covenants matter. Covenants matter. Now, what do I mean by that? There's a couple of different ways to define trust. One way to define trust is cognitive trust, which is, is whether the person you believe can do good work. You may not like them that much. Can you see that OK? You good? Sort of, kind of? OK. <laughs> OK. I'll, uh, where's, where are my notes? Notes? OK. 
All right, if you need to say, I'm going to do this real fast, real fast. Okay. Um, and then there's the other kind of covenant. There's this whole notion of affective trust, and this is what's built up over time. So this means that I show up and I'm all in. I kind of have irrational thoughts and feelings about the organization or other people. Now, what I'm interested in from an economic standpoint, does it matter? The three most important variables to have individuals feel this way about the organization. And this is what I find kind of intriguing. Number one, does this person have faith in senior management? Faith in senior management. That's number one. Number two, does somebody at work care deeply about me and my work. Now, if you look at this, this is where it starts to break down. Does somebody care deeply about me and my work? We, don't, we won't have time tonight, but when I ask 60-year-olds, write down the name of some folks in your life who loved you more than you loved you at work, start to write it down, and you can start to see their eyes kind of soften. And then I ask 40-year-olds, write down. And the 40-year-olds can write maybe two down. Do you see where I'm going with this? And then I ask 30-year-olds, write down the names of those people that you knew were there to get you through a rough path. And they look at me like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I'm going to be a little bit, I want to say this with love. I worry that because we're overwhelmed, we've simply created a broad brush and said, oh, those millennials, <laughs> boy, don't they need a lot of help. And they have this insatiable need. And I'm suggesting to you that 30-year-olds need what the 60-year-olds got. So all I'm suggesting is I invite you to consider that. Consider it. The last piece over here is, am I growing and developing? Okay. Now, why economically, why would I want to do this if I'm running a company? What's the correlation between having a covenantal relationship in the organization and high performance? It's high, right? I'm answering for you. How about covenantal and retention? High or low? Awesome. So I've joined an organization, and I love it. And I joined because of maybe of a couple of people. But somehow these folks are so overwhelmed, so overwhelmed, that they don't pay attention to me. And all of a sudden, I said, they said this. I, remember, we're back to the line of sight. They're back to Chris Argus. They said this, and this is how I experienced them. So guess what starts to happen? And this goes back to Shine's work in the, in the uh, late 70s and early 80s around career anchors and other dimensions. So now what this person does is they show up to work with their head but their heart and soul are somewhere else. Now, what's the correlation between contractual and high performance? You with me? Yeah. It's negligible. What about contractual and retention? This, to me, may be the most important notion of this idea about uh, covenants matter. It's mild meaning that there's individuals in organizations that don't know what to do with themselves. And the organization doesn't know what to do with themselves. And so then you start seeing these behaviors of working, working long hours and trying to look really busy, or s seeking credit where credit isn't due. Okay. 
And I've been tracking these, the cognitive distortions and the research on cognitive distortions. I'm going to go real fast because I'm already behind. But here are three or four cognitive distortions that get in our way as this begins to break down. And what's sad is that often, when we don't know what to do with them, we just decide, you know, I don't have the time to reconnect them. I know what I'll do. I'll just kind of ignore them, which is, of course, a form of abuse. Okay? Here are some cognitive distortions as we get back to this notion of, of, uh, of covenant. I just think, number one, this is called the asymmetric effect with a negative bias, which simply means that humans anchor more on negative emotions than they do positive. Positive emotions dissipate actually quite quickly. Right? That's why we create community like this, is so that we can build each other up. Uh, if you're a betting person, lose $500 or win $500. See which one's more, lose a close friend or gain a close friend. And so this is an important notion. This starts to break down. Number two, if we hear mixed messages, we start to interpret them negatively. If I teach a case, tell me your name. Tell me your name. Dennis. Dennis. If, if I'm teaching a case, and I'm running to some more students, and Dennis says, oh, that was a really good lecture. And I'm in a hurry, because I'm focused, and I kind of look at him, and then I run away. All of a sudden, he starts to hallucinate. He starts to think, well, Tom's arrogant. <laughs> I hate him. Then he might say, then he might say, I made a comment in class today. I thought it was a good comment. I guess it wasn't. And then it goes from there to, I thought Professor DeLong was going to give me a good grade. I guess he isn't. This took how long? Three seconds? Three seconds? So it really speaks to the, and by the way, I think everyone in this room could write a chapter of a book of a time that you sent a message that was as pure, the intentions were absolutely pure, and somebody took them in a way that uh, was painful. Um, number three, you all know this about uh, symmetry in relationships. It's based on social exchange theory, but it's this whole notion that we care about how much others are invested in what we in our relationships. Okay. Another way of saying it is, it is basically the power of least interest. The person in a relationship who has the least interest has the most power. And so then what happens is we start doing stupid things. Our children do stupid things to get our uh, subordinates, partners, because we're trying to figure this out. Are you as committed? Are you as invested in this as I am? And they haven't learned how to have the real conversation. It's getting warm. Is it just me or is it warm? Can we open some, maybe some doors or, okay. Or on it. And then the last one, the last one, is beware of, yeah, take sweaters off, whatever you like. The last one is beware of experiential avoidance. Experiential avoidance, what is that? That means I need to give feedback Tell me your name again. Dennis. I'm just beating up on Dennis. I need to give uh, Dennis some feedback, but I'm tired and I don't want to give it to him. I'm going to give it to him tomorrow. As soon as you say that, the tension in my body starts to dissipate, and I go, wow, I feel better already. But we know that the tension's going to come back within two hours. And then when it comes back, it's going to be more acute. And so what we're finding is, is that every time I delay it, this small conversation now becomes a major event. And you can't control major events. They never turn out how you think they're going to turn out. So I keep preaching hundreds of small conversations, small conversations, small conversations, small conversations. In fact, for some organizations, and some organizations are moving in the direction of confronting the dilemma around performance evaluations. Because performance evaluations, I say, oh, I can wait four more months, and then I'll give him the feedback in his yearly meeting. And then that breaks down, it, then that breaks down the connection around that. Okay. 
Last principle. The last principle I try, we try to teach them and that I try to do is what I call, it's not very sophisticated, do hard things. Do hard things. And I ask myself, am I just in a particular mode? Am I just in a particular mode? Um, I've been working with a gentleman. You may have heard of him. His name's Brian Stevenson. Do you, anyone know the name Brian Stevenson? Wrote Just Mercy. And uh, he's made these museums in Montgomery, Alabama. And he's trying to deal with the terrorism that's taken place with people of color for 400 years and have the conversation. And he says, you got to move to Montgomery, Alabama. I go down there and do interviews. And the folks that I'm interviewing down there said, they said, you Americans, <laughs> they're Americans. They said, remember when 9-11 came about? And someone says, this is the first time we've had terrorism on this land? <laughs> People of color just rolled their eyes. Rolled their eyes. Oh, really? So the question is, do I move to Montgomery, Alabama and set up a leadership training? And I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared to do it. I'm scared to pray because <laughs> I don't want to get the, have the answer. And I just, I worry that in this work, whether we come up with a, how would I say this, a model And we aren't pushing ourselves on a theoretical level, on, a, on, on the courageous meter. What do I mean by courageous? Doing things where you don't know what the outcome's going to be. Doing things where you don't know what the outcome is. And th my students are very confident, but not particularly courageous. Okay? And I just want to ask you where you are on that meter. Where are you on that meter? I'm much more courageous when I'm in control, da, 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 da. But the question is, is what are we going to do as a collective to keep growing and, <laughs> growing and developing and being just a little bit nervous? Hard things. Um, some things you, uh, oh, we're going to talk about her in a minute. Here's some things you can do. Now, you're going to say, Tom, this is where your research takes you. The first one takes me to uh, David Foster Wallace. It takes me to George Saunders. It takes me to Dorothy Ryan. I went to my 50th high school reunion in Portland, Oregon three weeks ago. And the first person that I saw, I was hoping to see my old girlfriend. <laughs> she came late. But the first person I saw was Dorothy Ryan. And Dorothy Ryan lived four houses from me, and I don't ever remember being, going in her house with the same age or walking to school with her. So when I'm in my self-doubting mode, the picture comes to mind is Dorothy Ryan. Now, what do these, the folks in literature say about this? The reason this is so hard is because humans believe Humans believe that the world revolves around them. And so it's hard to get out of that. I ask myself, when was the last time we can't get people promoted at Harvard at the business school? Why not? Well, because senior faculty are really busy. It takes time to teach. It takes time to mentor. It takes time to cry with folks doing research that they're not sure whether it's relevant. How often do I get up in the morning and say, what am I going to do today to honor the dreams of our younger faculty? Or how about my significant other? What am I going to do today to honor her dreams? Oh, I know. I'm going to wait till Mother's Day. <laughs> yeah. Fix them a real bad breakfast, and that's going to count. So it's this notion of, can you imagine what the world would be like if we were getting up in the morning and saying, what, 
am I going to do to, today to honor someone else as opposed to simply meeting my needs? Okay. And that's this notion of hard things, the whole notion of hard things. Number two, uh, you need to read Sherry Turkle's work. Have Sherry come and talk to you either this uh, next conference, her work on social media, and the impact on family systems, family dynamics. Dick could go on, Dick could go on and on and on about this. But what's interesting about what, I'm, what, what we're finding is, is that very tired parents are coming home and they just don't have their kids on, on screens because it gives them a little chance to breathe. The question is, is how are we going to reintroduce conversation? How are we going to reintroduce conversation? Um, and Sherry Turkle's work, she is very clear. She said, unless you create rooms and places in your home that are sacred, evenings that are sacred, now what we're seeing, we used to go, oh, we have, uh, Sherry has data on, on seventh graders and eighth graders that are texting five to 10,000 times a, a month. But now what we're seeing is their parents have picked up the speed. And now they're, now they've got used to the phone. Now they've got used. And so you have these things. And when I say doing hard things, can you imagine creating structures in your, in your life to protect, protect yourself? Um, know your patterns. If you haven't read the work about creating a user's guide, you need to, do you know the work on the user's guides? Um, when you buy something, when you buy, this will be, a, I think, a, a terrific activity in your work. When you buy something, there's a user's guide that tells you how to use it. And I'm suggesting you need to write a, a user's guide about you. This is what I really value. This is my style when I'm angry. Uh, when I want to get feedback. I'm trying as fast as, can, as we can to break down all the happy talk between people. Can you imagine having your kids, having your partner write a user's guide? It, it could take five minutes. But what we're attempting to do is help people with their patterns. Um, seek proximity. Uh, the closer you get to a person, the more you get to know them. This is the work from Robert Parkman uh, that wrote Bowling Alone. You need to go back and review Bowling Alone. But he says one of the problems we're having now in our country, he says in his work, he says communities need bonding and they need bridging. This is bonding. And he says what we forgot to do in America is to bridge, <laughs> is to connect with other communities and learn and learn and be humble. I had one of my students come up to me after the 2016 election, and we were I was teaching that next morning, and he says, Professor Long, I'm sick. Not th this election. He says, I don't know one person that voted for Trump. I go, OK. So what are you the most upset about? Are you upset that you only hang out with people that are like you? You don't know, you're going to be a leader, you're going to manage differences, and you don't know, and you're frightened to have the conversation because they all have horns or something crazy. So this is why I love this kid. He created a community chat room. He sent it out that said, hello, excuse me, but I need to meet people who voted for Trump. For Trump. I want to talk to them. In two days, 1,000 people. I said, the election, yeah, I have emotions about the election, but I've, I want him to be the kind, I want him to be the kind of person that people have a particular experience when they're with them because of how authentic he is. And he thinks he's going to get there by sameness. Sameness brings out the worst in us. Sameness brings out the worst in us. Um, I've talked about covenants matter. Um, and I've talked about doing hard things. I want to go back to the sacred places and spaces for a minute. There's a couple that lives in Newton. 
up the street where we live. <laughs> and they're an older couple, and they're always holding hands. Really. <laughs> no, really, they are. And sometimes he'll kind of give her a peck on the cheek. And so one day I went out and I said, why do you two like each other so much? <laughs> Being the sensitive person that I am. And what did they say? They said, well, every Sunday, excuse me, the first Sunday of every month, we go down to this little store or this little restaurant, and we have a gratitude breakfast. A what? A what? And she says, what did she say? Oh, we go down there, and we have to tell the other person three things that we're grateful for for them, partner. And then we have to give them, give them one thing that they can work on to make, make things better. I'm thinking, this couple, they're making me feel awful about myself. <laughs> And then I go, I use this story with executives, I don't know, probably 3,000 have rolled through HBS, and I say to all of them about sacred, sacred places and spaces, I say, oh, I know. You have gratitude dinners? Oh, no, I'm sure you do this once a month, or maybe every six months. They look at me. Well, they're busy. They're busy. Big organizations running big organization. And I'm saying, do you have the courage to do hard things? Do you have the courage to do hard things? And that's a hard thing to set up that structure when you're old and you're successful and you don't need to. So that's where I am on the express gratitude. This morning, you've already had an, excess, uh, had an exercise in that. What? Um, what I'd like to do is I want you to create a physical form because my students find this the hardest assignment around hard things. I make them write a letter of gratitude and then read it to the person. Okay. If they want to graduate, there's 320 students and their heart is right up in their throat. And they're going, would a text work? Let's try something a little scarier. Right, it doesn't have to be long, but then I want you to call that person and read it. Can you do it? Well, my parents, I don't think they could deal with it. You hear all of these stories. Oh, my parents, I don't know, you know, they're from the Midwest. They might not be connected to their emotions. Oh, really? Well, then don't you do it, you bozo. <laughs> so what I'd like you to do very quickly, we're going to run out of time. I want you to write down the, the initials of someone in your life that made it possible for you to be here right now. Or right now. Just write down the initials, and I dare you, over this week, and you folks can do this because you're courageous. Here's one student. This woman was raised in Beijing. I call her daughter of Beijing, <laughs> wonderful person. Um, and she, again, when the students do these, these things we ask them to do, then they have to write a me a reflection, and then I get back to them. But here's one, I just sh and I have her permission. Professor Geelong, I wrote two letters, one to my mother and one to my partner, Eric. It took me less than 15 minutes to write both of them. In fact, I was having trouble catching up to my thoughts and my writing. I read my first letter to Eric face to face. Previously, I imagined that I'd be smiling, and nervous smiling. But as soon as I read the first sentence, I started to cry. And bless Eric. 
Eric got up off the couch and went over to her and started to hug her until she finished reading the letter. And then he said, that's the best gift you've ever given me. It didn't cost a thing. His eyes were red and watery, so then I called my mom immediately in Beijing. <laughs> I could barely finish reading the letter. I paused several times to try to catch my breath and to stop my tears. Mom listened in silence, and then she said, are you OK? <laughs> I love moms, by the way. I have a thing for moms. Her voice was trembling and filled with joy. And this lovely woman, we have a slush fund at the business school to fly folks who have no money to graduation. And this woman came in at I don't know how high. And her eyes are just, she's just an angel. Her eyes are this big. And I just, I wanted to say, can I hang out with you? Although she didn't speak English. Just all the students are going, this is, this is an angel. She's walking around on her. Now, this is the part that's problematic or puzzling to me. It took me almost an hour to calm down after both letters. What I felt at the moments of reading these letters was a gush of unexplainable emotions. Why haven't I done this earlier? And I'm thinking, because it's hard. It's easy to thank you for a specific circumstance, but they've been there all the time. And then the last sentence makes me crazy. Professor DeLong, thank you for making me do it. And I'm thinking, three credit hours? $60,000 in tuition? Send the tuition money to me, and I'll write the letters. <laughs> it took a professor for you to write a letter of gratitude. It makes me crazy. And it, when the students come to visit me in my office, afterwards, we're just talking. Afterwards, they go, Professor DeLong, that felt like therapy. And I'm thinking, are we really there now? That any time you are connecting, connecting with an, and having a maturely vulnerable conversation, we've had to privatize it and call it something else. That's where we are. This is why, folks, you have so much work to do. So much work to do, and so do I. Now, I got to go fast, because I want to, I'm not going to, where's my little girl? Where's this, uh, you can put her up. Don't start it, though, because I want to tell you about, you know my couple, Sean? Don't you want to know about having to cut Sean and his, you do, do? I need more affect than that. Yeah, it's 6 o'clock. So it's graduation day. It's three months since he wrote this. And I'm standing there with my cap and gown on. And here, here comes this woman walking towards me really fast. And right behind her is Sean. And he's grabbing for her like, don't do it. I'm begging you, don't do it. She comes up this close. I mean, violates my space, which is hard to do. Are you Professor DeLong? And I'm thinking, so what is a white lie? <laughs> I'm having this internal conversation. So what is a white lie? I want to see. How can I frame this? I can do reframes all day long. And then I said, then I said, well, today I am. And so what does she do? <sighs> She hugs me, and I'm emotional, and she's emotional. And then she says something that's puzzling. She steps back and says, thank you for making me, thank you for making my future husband be honest with me. And I'm thinking, it took a professor? <laughs> it took a professor to help you try to disrupt this arc of communication. And they, she started to admit that they'd been selling, that they were selling images. And they were frightened of the essence stuff. And then they got to the essence stuff and says, well, this is where it's at. This is where it's at. Now, last story relates to this young six-year-old. 
whenever an executive group comes through, the last thing I ask them to do, you know, is to write the letter. This one guy from South America, great guy, writes a letter to his six-year-old daughter. And then he takes it and he scans it and sends it to his wife and asks his wife to read it to his daughter. And I was thinking, it's so typical of a guy. He only does half the assignment, you know, and then wants credit for it. But that's for another story. So, so what we have here is we have mom, this takes 90 seconds, reading this letter of gratitude from dad. And you'll have to listen really close, OK? Shall we, shall we do this? Shall we do this? Daddy sent you a letter. He said, Express gratitude. Thanks for giving me your true love, I know. Thanks for supporting me always. Thanks for being patient with me and understand my troubles. Thanks for changing my life. I promise you more time with you. I love you, I know. Do you like it, Noah? Yes. ¿Qué le dices a papi? ¿Qué le dices a papi, amor? There's a reason that we're told to be like children. So this dad calls me every month to thank me. And he's done it for like the last year. And I'm tired of him calling. I just want him just to hug your kid. I'm just teasing. But what does he say? Thank you for making me do this, because it's changed the way I communicate, that I talk with people, not to them. I'm talking with people. I'm using horizontal communication, not vertical. Now, last little story before we leave. Where did I learn the concept of doing hard things? Because in 1989, I had a woman with Coke bottle glasses that thick and stood about this tall, whose name was Rosa Parks. And I was her host for two days at the university before I headed east. And we, I, I was with her. And the last thing she said to me, hug. She looked at me and she, with her, with her stand up. <laughs> with her finger, like this, Tom, you better spend a life doing hard things. <laughs> Do hard things. So that's my blessing and my challenge uh, for you. Do, do some hard things. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to ask everybody for one more round of applause because I want us to remember that this is a voice of leadership at Harvard Business School saying create sacred spaces and be kind and be covenantal. We really are grateful, Tom, for your leadership voice. was the last thing. My letter from Mr. Rogers to me. Where did I put it? So my oldest daughter for my 50th uh, birthday got, there was a, 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 Mr. Rogers was on the front of Esquire in about 2000. She sent it to him and said, would you write on the, the to be my father's neighbor? 
So for my 50th birthday, I get this thing to put in my office. It says, for Tom DeLong, won't you be my neighbor? Okay. And then I wrote him a love note. <laughs> and I didn't think I'd get anything back. And he wrote me back. And if you were to see the, the, the isn't it the most beautiful writing you've ever seen? He sent me a book too. Actually, he put a book in the book. He says, I'm sorry, he says, Dear Professor DeLong. And he underlines, you are special. So just remember that. And then it says, then it says, your daughter Sarah tells me so. Kindest regards, Fred Rogers. So then in his letter, he writes this thing back, and I just, I knew he was a god then. <laughs> Dear Professor Long, how generous of you to write such a thoughtful letter. Thank you so much. It was fun to be of some help to Sarah. She wanted so much to give you a surprise. That says to me, what a special father you must be. He puts it right back on me, blesses me. <laughs> Uh, wishing you well in all that you do and grateful for your eloquent appreciation, uh, Fred Rogers. <laughs>